Uh, John Reuter is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. His research focuses on the politics of authoritarian regime, regimes with a focus on Russia. He is the author of The Origins of Dominant Parties, Building Authoritarian Institutions in Post-Soviet Russia, and is the author of numerous scholarly articles on elections, parties, public opinion, and political economy in Russia. So let's give him a welcome. And thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> yes, thanks for having me. And um, uh, it's, it, it's very heartening to see such an engaged crowd here. And uh, I'm glad that you're all interested in Russia. I mean, I, it's no surprise given current events, uh, I suppose. But, um, uh, but I'm, I'm glad to see it nonetheless. So uh, my talk today... Um, is going to be on the topic of public opinion and regime stability in Putin's Russia. And so the, the central guiding question for us today is how stable is Putin's regime? And we're going to look at that question through the prism of popular support for Putin. Um, now, I should say at the outset, um, um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions in Q&A about the war or U.S. policy towards the war, although I'm not an expert on U.S. policy. I'm an expert on Russian domestic politics, but I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, to conjecture on that, if you'd like. Um, uh, and we are going to talk a good bit about the war in this presentation today, but we're going to talk about it through the lens of how it affects public opinion in Russia and, and think about what it means for the, the future of Putin's Russia. So what I'm going to start, to do, start by doing is we're going to uh, talk about what kind of regime Russia is. And we're going to do this not just for academic purposes, but, but because... The type of regime that Russia is uh, determines the role that public opinion plays in Russian politics. Um, and then we're going to spend some time talking about why Vladimir Putin is so popular. And he is, in fact, popular, as far as we can tell from uh, public opinion polls. Um, and we're going to examine those underpinnings because what we really want to do where things are going to get good is in the, at the end of the talk where we think through whether the war is going to eventually erode public support for Putin and therefore erode uh, the stability uh, uh, of the regime. Uh, I should also note in my, it didn't, wasn't mentioned in the introduction, but this is, um, this is what I do in my actual research. Most of my research now is doing public opinion polls uh, in Russia. My colleagues and I, we run the, the longest running uh, election, series of election polls going in Russia, done by, at least done by Westerners. And so I'm active in doing polling in Russia. We have polls in the field right now. Um, and so that's what I, uh, mostly what I want to share with you. Um, okay, so let's start with some preliminaries in terms of what type of regime Russia is. R Russia is what political scientists call an electoral autocracy. And so what that means is that Russia has, in fact, all the institutional trappings of democracy. If you look at Russia's constitution, it, it's going to look like a democratic constitution. There's elections, a multi-party system, a legislature, an independent judiciary, uh, uh, human rights enshrined in the constitution. So it appears like uh, a democracy. Um, but <clears throat> incumbents in Russia, they take advantage of their privileged position in office to uh, 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 tip the electoral playing field in their favor to bend the rules of the game so that elections in Russia are not considered uh, free and fair. Um, but it's important to note a very important feature of these electoral autocracies, which is, by the way, the most common type of, elect of authoritarian regime in the world today. There are very few of these old style single party communist regimes left. There are very few military regimes left. Most of the, the authoritarian regimes that exist in the world today have multi-party elections. They just manipulate those multi-party elections so that outcomes uh, uh, are, are, are in the incumbent's favor. An important feature of these regimes is that because they, because they have these democratic-looking constitutions, um, the leaders of these regimes, like Vladimir Putin, they base their legitimacy on winning elections. So that may seem obvious, but think about how the leader of a, a monarchy, a traditional monarchy, bases their legitimacy. Well, they, they derive it from their 
their, their divine right to rule, let's say, or, or deep traditions, right? I, the king of Oman, have the right to rule because it's so set down in our traditions and, our, and uh, because I have a special relationship with God. Or if you're, you know, uh, if you're the Soviet Union, the leaders of the Soviet Union, they didn't say that they had the legitimate right to rule because they had won some multi-party election. They said they had the legitimate right to rule because they were uh, building a better society, they were building socialism, and that in order to build socialism, we had to have a one-party state that was going was going to guide the working class towards this better future. <coughs> so, uh, in electoral authoritarian regimes, though, um, rulers say that they have the right to rule because they win, the, win these elections. And so this gives us an insight already into why public opinion is important in these regimes. Because leaders say that they have the right to rule because the public supports them. Just like leaders in democracies say they have the right to rule because the public supports them. So um, uh, research in political science shows that these electoral autocracies like Putin's Russia are much more long-lived when the leaders of these regimes are popular. Um, being popular helps these regimes win elections without having to resort to massive ballot box fraud, which it turns out people don't like. And if you use massive ballot box fraud, people tend to pour onto the streets and protest. It as we just talked about, being popular helps legitimate the regime. It prevents social unrest. One of the greatest threats to authoritarian rule is mass revolution breaking out. So if you're popular, for obvious reasons, it's less likely that a mass revolution is going to catch on. And popular leaders are less likely to suffer from elite defections. They're less likely to have their lieutenants and their, their advisors and legislators and governors defecting from the regime, challenging them in elections, criticizing them in, in the media. So, um, so, uh, I'm quite certain that the regime in Russia is very concerned about what the public thinks, of, thinks about it. Um, the regime in Russia is obsessed with polling. They, they engage in a lot of polling, internal polling, to try to always keep tabs on what the public think, thinks of them. They watch election outcomes in Russia, especially at the local and regional level, to figure out you know, where there are grievances and, and where there are underperforming governors or where there's some social problem that needs to be addressed. And then we have lots of other evidence of, of instances in Russia where the regime has changed course on this or that policy measure, clearly because uh, um, it was unpopular. Uh, so one, one example of this was a, a pension reform in 2008. The regime was proposing to raise the pension age eight years, by eight years, from, from uh, uh, 58 to 65. And then there was this mass public outcry against this. And they, they backed off, and they lowered it, and they only, only raised it by five years. Um, and there's several other examples of this. In fact, as we'll talk about in a second, I think, if we have time, we're seeing a an example of this right now in Russia um, with the public backlash against uh, conscription, which they call mass mobilization in Russia, um, which has caused the regime to change course on who they're conscripting to fight in Ukraine. Okay, so that being said, okay, it's, it's, popular, uh, uh, it's important for these regimes to be popular. And luckily for Putin and his regime, Putin has always been uh, very popular in Russia. Um, so this is just his popularity rating over time. And when he came into office in the early 2000s, uh, um, he was very popular, routinely uh, polling about 70%. His, his popularity has kind of oscillated, bounced around since then, but that's kind of not the main story. The main story here is that it's never dropped below 60%. And uh, it's usually made, remained somewhere around, around 70%. So why, why is this? Well, I think we can um, explain Putin's popularity as a product of what I'll call five pillars. Um, so the first pillar we might call his intrinsic popularity or something that's just a type of popularity, a source of popularity we would be familiar with in a democracy, which is simply that many voters like Putin as a politician and they like his policies. So on this first point about views of Putin's character, surveys show that voters view Putin as smart, professional, competent, uh, 
honest, a strong leader, serious. Um, but that's not to say, and that actually, what I'm about to say, I think, gives these, uh, these survey results more meaning. That's not to say that people just like everything about Putin. So they actually don't find him particularly charismatic. They don't think that he's empathetic. If you ask people, do you think Putin cares about people like me? Majority say no. Um, he's not viewed by Russians as a type of politician that you want, that you would like to have a beer with. They instead, well, not, not all of them, but many Russians tend to think of him as, like I said, smart, competent, professional, a uh, strong and effective uh, leader. And we should also note that uh, many voters, certainly not all, but there's a large chunk of voters in Russia that like Putin because they like uh, his centrist policy course. We don't need to talk a lot today about what exactly Putin's policy course uh, has been, but he occupies this kind of centrist, maybe center-right position on the economic spectrum. It's become somewhat more culturally conservative over time. But generally speaking, um, in any political system, it's, it's beneficial electorally to be situated in the center of the political spectrum, and, that, and that's where Putin has, has positioned himself ideologically. The second pillar, and this is a really big one, uh, it's very important and very important for the main message in today's talk, uh, is performance evaluations. Lots and lots of Russians support Putin because they think that he has made Russia better off. Um, so the big one here is economic performance, and this chart is just showing you uh, GDP per capita in Russia over time. Most of you are probably aware that in the 1990s in Russia, Russia was experiencing a very severe economic crisis, um, uh, much more severe, for instance, than the Great Depression in the United States. Um, but coincidentally, and I do mean coincidentally, I don't mean that ironically, after Putin came to office, Ru Russia experienced a, a, a rapid economic rebound, and Russia's economy has grown apace since then. It's, su it's slowed down somewhat in the, in the past few years. Uh, but the general story of Putin's rule in the mind of many voters is one of economic uh, resurgence. Um, voters also credit Putin with restoring what they view as stability and political order after a time of law lawless lawlessness and chaos during the 1990s. And they also credit Putin with restoring Russia's rightful place as a major player in world politics, which many Russians felt had been lost in the 1990s. Um, so, that's the second pillar. The third pillar, maybe a little harder to get our heads around, but let's, let's go through this, uh, is what I would call political uh, disengagement. So, um, Putin's support, so right now it's sitting at about 75%, if you just ask Russians, do you support Putin or not support Putin? 75%. It's very wide. That's three quarters of the Russian public says they support uh, Putin. But when you dig in a bit, you find out that that support base is very wide, but it's actually quite shallow. And true believers, people who very strongly support Putin, their strong ide ideologues for Putin and his policy course are rather few, maybe 20 to 30 percent uh, of the electorate. A large share of those who support Putin, they're more politically disengaged, they're politically apathetic, and they're just kind of going along to get along, and they kind of support Putin uh, um, because for, for a variety of reasons. Many of them because they believe there's no credible alternatives, um, or maybe because of social pressures, or because they think it's the politically or socially desirable thing to do to say so. Um, uh, but the general point is that uh, one of the things that undergirds the regime's stability is that they that the regime is not asked a lot of its citizens, typically, ideologically. It doesn't ask them to be invested in politics. It doesn't ask them to be, to be ardent supporters of the regime. This is in stark contrast to communist regimes, right, which very much did ask their supporters to be ardent supporters, ask them to be engaged in the ideological struggle against, as it was, capitalism. <clears throat> Another key pillar of support for Putin is what I'll call elite unity. And this is simply the notion that um, 
all, almost all important political elites in Russia support Putin, so there aren't a lot of influential opinion leaders in Russian society who are out there going on television criticizing Putin or influential governors who are going to their constituents and saying, oh, Putin's doing a bad job. Everyone is on the same page. They're on message about supporting Putin. And then, of course, that kind of creates a feedback loop such that because everyone supports Putin, it's very politically dangerous uh, to oppose Putin, and therefore um, this equilibrium of elite support for Putin is sustained. The final pillar that I, I presume and hope have, you've already thought of is, is the fact that Russia is an authoritarian system. And so uh, there are limits on competition, limits on uh, uh, the opposition, limits on free speech. And so, of course, Putin is portrayed by the media in a much better light than he would be if Russia were a, a democracy. And because there are limits on the opposition, uh, he doesn't suffer the same criticism that a politician would uh, in a, um, a democracy. But there are limits to this authoritarian control. There are limits to the extent to which um, the narrative about Putin can be controlled, information about the government and its actions can be controlled. Um, and so we don't want to overstate the extent to which the state can just shape public opinion to to its will. Okay. Um, now, now what I want to do is I'm actually going to uh, um, talk a little bit about support for the regime uh, uh, on the eve of the war. So, in, in uh, December and January, 2021-2022, because I think this is important because. This is kind of a snapshot of what the status quo was like before we had this high, highly irregular event happening where you have this rally around the flag effect and this upsurge of patriotism that I'm going to talk about uh, in a second. So um, one thing we should note, even though that the Putin's popularity is consistently high, is that it was at its historically lowest point right on the eve of war. It was kind of settling out here around 60%. Um, and so, at least in terms of, of uh, uh, Putin's popularity, it was not, um, at, um, not at its highest point. And more importantly, and very worryingly for uh, the authorities in Russia, performance evaluations of the regime have begun to decline. I know there's a lot of numbers here, so I'm going to walk you through what's important to look at. So, on uh, opinion surveys that, that um, my colleagues and I have conducted over the past several years and were conducted by our predecessors prior to that, uh, we ask respondents, um, since Putin came to office in 2000, have the following things increased, decreased, or stayed the same? And we'll just focus on the red numbers uh, uh, for a moment. And first here, let's look at the standard of living. Has your standard of living uh, uh, gotten better or gotten worse or stayed the same. And so, uh, 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 far less than the majority of voters think that their standard of living has now gotten better under Putin. This was not the case, and we don't have the, the survey data here, but this was not the case 10 years ago or 15 years ago under Putin. But increasingly, the regime was not getting high marks for uh, economic performance. Similar with responsiveness of government, Corruption, almost, almost a majority said that corruption had increased, actually. Uh, inequality, almost large majorities thought that inequality had increased under Putin. Now, <clears throat> Russia's influence in the world, this is one area, the two areas where Putin does do well among voters, is that uh, people thought that Russia's influence in the world had increased, but note that this share was decreasing over time in the years leading up to the war. And the same thing for those who said that political stability in Russia had increased. Uh, that share of voters was uh, decreasing in the years leading up to, to the war. So the point here is, right before the war starts, the regime is on probably its shakiest ground in terms of public support since uh, 2000. 
So that's a backdrop. Now, let's, let's pivot and uh, talk about uh, the war and how it's affected public opinion in Russia. <clears throat> but before we do that, I do want to uh, set the stage by discussing what public opinion toward some hypothetical war was, or so the, what public opinion towards Ukraine and confrontation with the West was before the war. Um, because this is going to um, play an important part in our story uh, when we note that, well, I'll save that for later. But um, first of all, Russians' attitudes towards Ukraine and their attitudes towards, towards um, uh, relations between Russia and Ukraine. So in November of 2021, this, this particular poll asked respondents whether they thought Ukraine and Russia should be one state. And very few Russians thought that was the case. The vast majority of Russians thought that Ukraine should be an independent state. And we get these same responses going back in time, all the way back to the 1990s. The vast majority of Russians think that Ukraine and Russia should be, one, should be uh, separate states. Ukraine should be independent. Interestingly, before 2014, a larger share of Ukrainians thought that Ukraine and Russia should be one state uh, than, than Russians did. That changed, of course, dramatically after uh, the war in, uh, in the Donbass. <clears throat> the war, opinions on the conflict in Ukraine. Um, so this question is asked in December of 2021. And the question was, what, what should Russia do about the war in Ukraine? So remember, before the current war started, there was already a war going on in the Donbass region of Ukraine. And this question that we asked, asked respondents, what do you think the Russia should do about this war? And only a tiny share of Russians thought that Russia should engage in some sort of armed conflict to help the separatists in the Donbass and fight against the Ukrainian government. You know, a little bit more thought that they should maybe arm the separatists, but the vast majority of respondents thought that the government shouldn't, either shouldn't be involved at all or just offer some humanitarian a resistance or moral or moral support. So the very important point here is that this war that is going on right now wasn't called for by Russian society. It wasn't as if Russian society wanted war in Ukraine, um, at least before the war started in uh, December, January of, of last year. Similarly, in terms of confrontation in the, with the West, I think there's a misperception especially now that the war has started, that the Russian public kind of views the West as an enemy or as a rival. Um, but that's not the case at all. Polls before the war started consistently showed that large majorities of Russians did not want confrontational relations with the West. So in this question, um, there are different opinions about the type of relations that Russia should have with the West. What do you think? How should Russia relate to the West? So a sizable majority, I guess if we add these two up, that's going to be close to 70% of Russians said that we should think of the West as either as a friend or as an, as an ally. And a very tiny share of respondents, about 8%, said we should think of the West as an, as an enemy. So this is a very, you know, this, this is from December 2021, and now we're already in this, you know, swept up in this rhetoric about nuclear holocaust and confrontation between uh, uh, the West and Russia. So again, the point being, the point I'm trying to drive home is that this confrontational uh, relationship with the West was not necessarily called for by, uh, wasn't demanded by the Russian public. This wasn't a sentiment that was pre-existing uh, in Russian public opinion. Okay, <coughs> now let's come to the actual war. So <clears throat> after the war starts, there is a rally around the flag effect in Russia. And opinion polls showed that sizable majorities of Russians supported the military operation. Now, they did this both because, you know, rally around the flag effects, they don't just happen in autocracies. They happen in the United States, as most of you all know. In all democracies, these things happen in time of war. People tend to support uh, the government in power. Um, but these types of rally around the flag effects are, of course, accentuated in authoritarian regimes where the state controls the media, controls the narrative, and therefore people are able to are, are consume a lot of government propaganda, uh, and uh, television is heavily censored in Russia, and so they don't, aren't exposed to alternative viewpoints. 
Um, and so in that backdrop, there was strong, but not overwhelming, strong but not overwhelming support for the military operation uh, in Russia. And in concert with this, Putin's popularity also spiked up. So back to its historic highs. Uh, people, like I said, rallying around the flag and, and supported, uh, said they supported the government more after the war started. However, Support for the war has been declining since then, and now this latest poll, which is just two weeks old, this is not my poll, by the way, it's some colleagues who do this work in Russia, uh, it's sitting just above 50%. So it's reached its lowest point since the war uh, began. And this, <coughs> this tick downward that you notice here is almost certainly, although it's only three percentage points, but I think it's gonna grow, uh, is almost certainly in response to um, uh, the Russian government announcing mass mobilization. They're going to be conscripting soldiers into the army and sending them to Ukraine. Prior to this, con there have been some mistakes, but conscripts were not, for the most part, fighting on the front lines uh, in Russia. I mean, sorry, in Ukraine. Now, interesting, so <clears throat> support for the war is at its lowest point. And if you phrase the question differently, uh, you... you, you uh, um, uh, you begin to see that support for the war is on pretty shaky ground. So, oh, I meant to translate this for you, but anyways, uh, this uh, question phrasing says, uh, what do you think? Should we start, to, uh, or should, we, should the Russian government continue uh, its military activities in Ukraine, or should we start peaceful negotiations? And so the orange lines are start peaceful negotiations, the blue lines are continue with the military operation, and so it's about even. If you add these two up, well, 48 to, uh, actually the, the start, military, start uh, peaceful negotiations group is a little bit bigger than the continue the war uh, group. So. Support for the war as it stands right now in October 2022 to about 50-50. But a very important uh, thing has happened in Russian politics that's completely novel. And that is that there is very high levels of polarization over the war. So we're very, in this country, we're very familiar with polarization. This is you know, something that is, uh, is uh, um, um, uh, it's, everyone's talking about because we have the highest levels of pol political polarization in the United States since the Civil War right now. But in Russia, actually, prior to the war, there very, wasn't very much political polarization. Society wasn't drawn into two ideologically opposed camps. People who supported Putin didn't really, most people who supported Putin didn't really hate people who supported the opposition. And most people who, who supported the opposition didn't really have very strong negative feelings towards people who support Putin. They're like, oh, okay, fine. Most people were kind of apolitical, and even if they were involved in politics, they kind of, you know, understood that if, the, the, if, if one of their friends or family members supported the opposition or the, the opposing party. But what happened with the war is that society started to polarize around the issue of the war, and in particular on a generational dimension. So support for the war among... Uh, older generations is much, much, much stronger than it is among under generations. So among, among younger generations, it's fair to say, I think, that more people are opposed to war than, the, than support the war, and the obverse is definitely true for uh, older generations. And you see this same thing uh, if you stratify that other question that I put up there uh, by age group. that. Younger voters, those under 40, are much more likely to say, again, this orange is saying that they prefer to start negotiations, they're much more likely to say that they want the regime to start negotiations. Okay, and I'll interpret this in a second. This, this, this is very important for our, for our final conclusion, but I'll say more about that in a second. The final thing to note, this is just important context for our discussion is that the war, of course, has put the Russian economy into economic crisis. Um, and this is at a time, this is very important to note, 
when most other economies in the world are growing very rapidly, right? So you have this, every country in the world goes into a recession because of COVID, and then almost every country in the world is bouncing back, right? their economies are bouncing back rapidly after COVID. Russia's going in the opposite direction because of the sanctions, because of the business, uh, the, the uh, business, uh, voluntary business withdrawals. Um, so you have a 5% drop in quarter on quarter drop in GDP in Q2 and inflation at high levels. And uh, public opinion polls bear this out, that Russians are feeling this pain. 56% say they've had to be more frugal because of rising prices. 39% say their income has been affected in some way uh, by the war. And as you might expect, though, those who are, have suffered economic consequences due to the war, uh, surveys show they're less supportive of uh, the war. And so, <clears throat> given that we expect, um, we don't expect Russia's economy to improve so long as the war is going on, it's going to continue to be in recession or at least stagnation, one would expect these numbers to grow and one would expect this to eat away at support uh, for the war. And I would say that this is particularly problematic for the regime given that on the eve of war, it, back in 2021, uh, Russians were less and less likely to um, uh, approve of the job that Putin was doing in handling the economy. Um, so, okay, so let me sum up some of these points. I uh, see what I, what, which points I have made and haven't made. So I made the point that war, this war wasn't, um, wasn't fueled by a demand from society. Uh, I've also made the point that current levels of support are really mostly a, 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 a function of this rally around the flag effect that's manufactured by propaganda and censorship. There wasn't strong support for su such a war before the war started. Um, and then the, those who support the war, and therefore Putin, uh, are made up of two two groups, I would say. One is vigorous supporters, and then the second group are those who are kind of passively acquiescing to what the government is doing. But what's precarious for the Putin regime is that we know from political science that these patriotic rallies around the flag effect, they can be very intense in the moment, but they can also very dissipate very quickly because they're often founded on what are, at the time, like I said, intense emotions, but they're not rooted in strong ideological convictions. And so as these emotions fade away, they can dissipate very quickly. Um, and that is a particular danger for the regime. And uh, also one of the reasons, I think, that the regime is often ratcheting up its rhetoric and ratcheting up its, um, uh, 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 the, the, the rhetoric around confrontation with the West in order to keep fanning the flames of this rally around the flag effect. Because if it dissipates, the regime collapses. The, the final point is about polarization. So, as I said before, prior to the war, Russia was really a, mostly an apathetic, depoliticized society. People just didn't follow politics, care about politics, and they definitely were polarized. Now, for the first time in post-Soviet history, we have people that are really angry and engaged with politics, specifically on the issue of the war. So. You know, 29% of respondents say that they've stopped speaking to a relative or friend over the war. Um, that's not something that, that would be unheard of, you know, not speaking to a relative or friend because of something political prior to the war. Um, um, and so what the, the concern here for the regime would be that now you have a, a sizable share of Russians, young Russians it turns out, who are who have very strong negative attitudes about the regime. They're very angry about it. They're not apathetic anymore. And so if that rally around the flag effect starts to dissipate, you're going to be left with some core of people who are actually quite motivated and angry and politicized. And uh, that could be very perilous, I think, for the regime. All right, so I'm going to leave it there. And I very much look forward to hearing your questions and comments. You talk about Putin being so popular and not having any 
everybody that is opposed to him. What about the gentleman? I mean, if you were opposed to him, you were thrown in jail. What about the gentleman that was poisoned, I can't think of his name, came back, Nivaldi. Is he still in jail? Does he have followers? What is his <coughs> situation politically? How was that resolved? Great, Sorry. yeah, so the, you're, the person you're talking about is Alexei Navalny. So yeah. Alexei Navalny is um, uh, the most staunch opposition figure in Russia. Opposition in Russia is a complicated uh, entity. There are some parts of the opposition that are kind of co-opted by the regime and and work with the regime somewhat, temper their criticism of the regime in exchange for access to policy. Uh, and then there are um, there is the parts of the opposition that's headed by mostly Alexei Navalny who don't temper their criticism of the regime and are very, very staunch critics of the regime and they call openly for the removal of the regime and you know would support they do support mass street protests as a potential way to, to uh, uh, remove Putin from power. And uh, yeah, so Alexei Navalny, the leader of this, he was put in jail. He was first poisoned by the FSB, incontrovertible evidence of that. And then he's, since then, he's been in jail. Um, uh, I mean, uh, very uh, tragically and maca in, in macabre fashion, that he was put in jail for violating his parole he was supposed to check in because he was already he had already um, had been convicted of another crime and he was on parole and he was supposed to check in with his parole officer while he was abroad, but he could not check in because he was in a coma from being poisoned, and then they put him in jail for not checking in with his parole officer. Uh, so yeah, he's in prison, but he still has a following. His support base uh, was unfortunately never very wide before this. Part of that, of course, is due to Russia's authoritarian system and the fact that. His megaphone was stifled, right? He could only speak to his supporters through the internet. He wasn't allowed, of course, on state television. Um, uh, but at the same time, he is a very, um, um, for many Russians, he's kind of, a, 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 he's a too hard line of a political figure. He's a very, he's a very, um, for some, he has a very grating political presence, and he's not, he, he doesn't, uh, he, he turns off some Russians, and so that also limited his, um, his ability to uh, expand his support base. This is very common in, in closed authoritarian regimes where dissidents, the type of person who's begun, who has the kind of courage, courage and strident um, personality to become a dissident, is often not the same type of person who's a good politician in democratic politics. Um, and that's what we are observing with the Lexi Where do you get your list of respondents, or how do you contact them to get all of your information for these polls? Right, so um, um, we work with a, a survey company in Russia that has been doing surveys in Russia since the Soviet period, actually. And um, they, they um, draw a representative samples. So they have survey teams in scores of Russian regions. And you first draw a sample of regions. And then within each region, you draw a sample of settlements. That would be cities and villages. You do that randomly at both those stages. And then within those settlements, let's say it's a village, you're going to randomly select households to interview. And then within each household, you're going to randomly select a respondent. And so it's done just the same way that opinion polls are done in the United States or any other country. Except in Russia, the quality of opinion polls is actually a lot higher than in the United States because they're still done face to face. Um, and that's possible in Russia because the cost of labor is much lower. So you can actually go into someone's home, make tea, sit down at the kitchen table, and do an interview with them. And it's not these annoying things you all get on your phones where you're trying to do a survey over text or someone's calling you in, in a robotic voice doing a poll. So. I think she's in charge. 
Um, with the polling, and you mentioned the regional, is there any polling? I don't know the population distribution of Russia. I'm, I'm assuming western end of Russia is the majority of population, how it is out on the hinterland. The other factor is, as I understood, a lot of the recruiting in the Army is from the rural areas in the western or the eastern part of the state and promises of money. And I'm wondering how that works into the polling. I'm going to throw one more. If Putin suddenly should have a heart attack or fall from a, a building and die, what's the power void? Who, who's next in line? Nabali's in prison. He doesn't sound like much, but is there any group that would come in and fill that void? Okay. Your first, I, got, I remember the second one. The first one was... Can you remind the regional distribution, how the polling, does any polling indicate eastern Russia or western Russia versus eastern? I don't know the distribution of population in that country. It's huge. Right. I know the eastern St. Petersburg and Moscow, but, you know. Well, in terms of drawing a sample, it would be done in a representative fashion. So the areas that are less populated, you'd have less respondents from there, and Moscow would have more respondents because there's more people from there. So it is it is nationally representative. If, is if there that's a power situation? The farther you get away from Moscow, how's the reliance on the party out of the Moscow, the central? So, Jen, I mean, yeah, in terms of regional distributions of support for Putin, which I guess maybe you're asking about, so, like, it is true that uh, in Siberia and the Far East, they traditionally have lower levels of support for the authorities. <coughs> it's kind of Siberia, the Far East is kind of the wild west of Russia. They, they fancy themselves as being more free thinking and more independent uh, than, uh, than, than the western parts of Russia. So you do see those patterns in public opinion polls. Your second question uh, was, well, now I've already lost that one. You have to remember. Void. Oh, that, 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 okay, I can do the void. Yeah. So, um, what we don't know, and that question is impossible to answer because, and it relates to what I was saying in response to her question, the type of people who are going to be effective politicians in a democratic system are the, not the same type of people who are effective politicians in an autocratic system. And that goes for dissidents, but it also goes for politicians within the regime. Some of the people who are close to Putin within the ruling party, let's say, they have made their careers within this autocratic system and they know how to advance their political careers in that system. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if tomorrow the whole thing collapses and we have free and fair elections and the TV lights are on and they're having open debates, that that's going to make them into, into good politicians. So we've seen this happen over and over and over again in countries that transition from authoritarianism to democracy. And oftentimes totally new figures emerge that people didn't predict would emerge uh, would emerge beforehand. Okay, so the Weimar Republic uh, can result in the backlash with Hitler. And the same thing is come out, going on in this country right now. It's going to lead to an economic collapse, and it might lead back to what we had before. Uh, I wonder what happened in Russia in the 90s that led to Putin. Right. Well, I mean, uh, so there's an argument out there that there's that um, uh, many people supported Putin because they saw him as uh, rectifying many of the social ills that had existed during the 1990s. So in the 1990s in Russia, there was this collapse in state capacity. There was this breakdown in law and order. There was this economic crisis. The state. Uh, that the, so, the, the uh, social safety net that existed in the Soviet Union had collapsed. Um, and so much of Russian society was adrift in the 1990s. And uh, it's unclear how much Putin is responsible for this. More likely it's just due to the fact that oil prices went up in the early 2000s. But whatever the reason, Putin comes to power and a lot of these problems begin to be fixed. And so Putin is very lucky to be coming to office during this period, I think, when uh, the Russian economy and the power of the Russian state and, and Russia's foreign policy influence were all being restored. Well, I'm just wondering if it was the same as like the Weimar Republic, but like, we're kind of in the early stage of that. It's going to lead to an economic collapse. Well, you know, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, it's a good, it actually 
right now the crisis in Russia isn't nearly as bad as it would have been under Weimar Germany, right? So they're in a recession. They're in a recession, but it, it's not a deep depression yet in terms of dropping output. I'm at, I'm at the 90s. Hmm, yeah. So it was, is that was the deep depression? Well, we're 30 years away from that. Uh, or, yeah, 30. Yeah, 30 years away from that. It's a long time, so. I do have a question. What is the average standard of living for most um, Russians? Mm. And how does that play? I mean, do they get, are they allowed to travel? I mean, I've heard that they've gotten, they've been allowed enough of the Western kinds of things just to keep them peaceful and happy. Uh, is there any truth to that? Um, well, <laughs> Russia's not a closed society in that sense. I mean, before the war. I mean, before the war and the, the 30 years after the collapse of communism, like, um, people are allowed to travel freely. Um, Russia has a middle class. Many people go on vacation abroad. Um, I think the latest polls suggest over half of Russians have, have traveled abroad, probably more than Americans have traveled abroad. Um, and uh, now that doesn't necessarily mean that their standard of living is higher than the United States. The average uh, income in Russia is much lower than the United States. Um, uh, and uh, the median income is even lower. So there's very high inequality in Russia. There's, there's, there's a lot of very rich people um, and then a lot of very, very poor people. So inequality is high in the U.S., as we all know, but it's even higher in Russia. I'd be interested to hear your comments about <coughs> Putin's uh, rattling his atomic weapon threat. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, I hope, <laughs> at least, that this is um, a bluff, you know. He's, so what's happened is, like, the battlefield situation in Ukraine is not going in Russia's favor. Um, in, they're outnumbered on the battlefield in, in Ukraine because Ukraine declared general mobilization of all able-bodied men and even many women. Uh, and so, and Ukraine's not necessarily that small of a country, right? It's about 40 million people. Russia's about 145 million people. Uh, and Russia is fighting there just with primarily contract troops, so professional soldiers. And so they're currently outnumbered on the battlefield, and so they're uh, losing ground right now. Um, and um, so, you know, I think... Hopefully, Putin is using this nuclear threat to try to get the West to back off and not provide more weapons uh, uh, to Ukraine. The reason why I do think that's right, and he's not just crazy and going to use nuclear weapons, is because there are a lot of levels of escalation, I think, that Russia could engage in short of using nuclear weapons. There would be no reason to escalate all the way to nuclear weapons at this point. And, and by the way, to the extent anyone's discussing nuclear weapons, I think most people are talking about tactical nuclear weapons, battlefield nuclear weapons, not launching ICBMs against the United States. And, um, and so there, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of things Russia could do to escalate, but bombing more civilian infrastructure, bombing government installations in Kiev, which they've, which they've avoided doing thus far, destroying the Ukrainian electricity grid, which they've avoided doing thus far. They may have started doing just yesterday and the day before. Um, but there's a lot of things they could do before they get to nuclear weapons. Um, so I think it's a bluff, and I think, you know. But, I mean, <laughs> we have to hope it's a bluff, because if it's not a bluff, we're all screwed, and there's no point in analyzing anything anyways. <laughs> Do you have any statistics on uh, voting? How many people vote? Do they have confidence in voting? Or the younger generation, the older generation? Yeah, so um, uh, uh, rates of voter turnout in Russia are about the same as they are in the United States, roughly speaking. However, um, hmm, um, um, and and uh, a lot of people who, who participate in elections, probably about mm, 70 to 75 percent, they think that elections are more or less free and fair. These are people who support the regime. And so, you know, they engage in motivated reasoning or motivated skepticism, 
And they are like, well, you know, more or less elections are free and fair, or this isn't that bad, fraud's not that bad. I go, I vote for United Russia, I vote for Putin, I get on with my day. Um, there's also a large chunk that are kind of coerced into voting. Um, so something that's very common in Russia is what's called workplace voter mobilization. And so uh, a lot of votes are mobilized in Russia through the workplace. You're, the boss at your factory says, okay, it's election day, we all have to go vote, and everyone goes out and vote. Um, and so a lot of those people, they're not that jazzed about voting. They're just doing it in a perfunctory, in a perfunctory manner. Um, but, um, but yeah, but that leaves, I mean, for context, you know, rates of voter participation in the U.S., I compared it to the U.S., and I said it's about the same as the U.S., but rates of voter participation in the U.S. are very low relative to other democracies. And so there's a lot of people in Russia, just like in the U.S., who don't vote and don't think that elections are worth participating in, and they're completely uh, disaffected from electoral politics and don't believe in it. That's true. Anybody else? Any other questions? I just got a quick um, thought. I'm just kind of curious about the their gross production, their economy. Um, how much is their gross production output and balancing with what they need to potentially suppress their population. I mean, what's the spending cost militarily? And in contrast to that military budget, what is their budget for social suppression, for lack of a better term, I guess? When you say social suppression, do you mean like repression or do you mean like spending on social services to keep people shaping happy popularity, staying in power, you know, you have a certain amount of that in China. The spending there is getting higher and higher mm -hmm. and higher. You know, and I would <coughs> say in Russia, they have to spend quite a bit on their budget. Yeah. Going towards policing and making sure the population stays in check. Well, I wouldn't put it that way. I actually don't think there's a, a, a very large share of the budget that goes to domestic repression. Um, that's probably just not a major line item. What's a, what is, is a, the two huge line items? are actually the same in Russia as they would be in the United States or almost any country, which would be military spending and social spending. So spending on pensions, that's the big government expenditure and, and health care and, and um, you know, wealth, what we would call welfare support. So I guess maybe so, I'm looking at the budget to shape popular opinion. Uh -huh. You know, he is not going to necessarily let the uh, shine come off his image. So the cost to the people to keep his ego going for no other way of putting it, um, how is that sustainable in the long run, you know, economically, before it begins to fade and that, you know, he cannot sustain this? He's age 70 right now. How well, I agree. People but people want to support this? Yeah, yeah well, that, that's the point is that, like, primarily he's generating support. Or primarily the regime generates support by... Uh, demonstrating that's able to provide an adequate standard of living for people. So that's what's expensive, is maintaining spending on social services, maintaining spending on pensions. Um, in Russia, just like in any country in the world, it's the older generations that vote more, and so they're the ones that are politically relevant and important. And so pensions are the main thing that they care about, because pensions are state provided in Russia. There's almost no, almost no private pensions whatsoever. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so you're right in that a constraint for the regime is how, in the face of economic crisis, it can continue, um, yeah, spending on social services such that people don't get upset with their standard of living. Yeah. Another question? I guess that's it then. Oh. How important are the oligarchs to Putin in keeping him in power and supporting him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question um, because the uh, traditional belief among Russia watchers is that they were absolutely crucial, that they were kind of one of the legs of his regime. Um, 
And by oligarchs, she means this group of people who became fabulously wealthy in the 1990s because of their close ties with the state, but also because they were able to accumulate a large amount of economic assets in Russia during the transition from communism to capitalism. And uh, so these are big businessmen, we would call them in the US, captains of industry, except for in Russia, they have very, very close ties to the state, all of them. And um, uh, certainly when Putin came to power, he was very reliant on the support from the oligarchs. And he made a deal, a very famous deal with the oligarchs when he came to power. When the deal was, you get to keep everything that you took control of or stole or whatever it may be the case during the 1990s, but, but you don't, the deal was you get to keep that and you, but the, then you don't support the opposition, you have to support me. And so uh, everyone believed that their support was very important. The war comes along and uh, many of these oligarchs, not all of them, they lost almost everything because a lot of their assets were in the West and these were of course among the first individuals that the West placed sanctions on. So all these stories you read about yachts being seized and bank accounts frozen, these are the oligarchs, right? And so everyone thought, aha, well this is gonna imperil his regime and they're going to you know, tell Putin to take a hike because what's the point of supporting Putin if I can't have a yacht in Monaco, right? And, uh, but it turned out that in 2022, their support wasn't as important anymore or that you know, they didn't have the same influence over Putin that they once did. And uh, the, security, the support of the security services, the FSB, uh, uh, the army, um, the other security services it seems to be more important for Putin than supporting oligarchs. Are sanctions really effective against Russia? Because you hear that, for instance, India is getting their oil now from Russia. China is uh, dealing with Russia. The Western world needs uh, the oil from Russia as far as uh, Europe is concerned. <coughs> How long can we, in your opinion, can we stay united? Right, so, well, yeah, on the first point about how effective sanctions are, well, uh, they're both effective and ineffective. They're effective in the sense that the Russian economy is in recession and they've lost a lot of government, government revenue because of you know, Western oil embargoes and because of, uh, of sectoral sanctions. And, and more actually, the, the, the largest part actually of the recession in Russia is not so much uh, government actions, it's the informal business withdrawals. Because after the war, tons and tons of Western corporations just took their business out of Russia preemptively. Maybe some were concerned about later getting sanctioned for doing business with Russia. Others were concerned about problems um, financing their operations in Russia because there were sanctions in the Russian banking system. And still others were concerned about the, what the, the PR um, consequences of continuing to do business in Russia. Whatever the case may be, like almost all Russian businesses withdrew from Russia, and that's really the big thing that's causing recession in Russia. But to the, the second point about there being ineffective, of course sanctions against a country as big and um, pivotal in the global economic system as Russia are going to be less effective than would be sanctions against North Korea or Venezuela. Uh, because, well, A, Russia's just a big economy in its own right. It's better able to kind of, um, better able than many other countries to um, uh, provide for itself. Um, uh, but then also, as you're alluding to, uh, a lot of Russia's uh, market for its products, and of course its primary product is, is hydrocarbons, uh, a lot of that market is not in the West. It's actually in China and India and Turkey, the Middle East, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but that being said, I mean, <clears throat> The West is still a crucial market, especially for gas, and that's why you know most of Europe is still buying gas from Russia. Oil is a different story from gas. I'm talking about natural gas. Natural gas, um, West, a lot of Europe, not so much Western Europe, but Central, a lot of Central Europe is still very dependent on Russian gas, and they're, st they're still buying it for that reason. Yeah, I would say these sanctions have been very ineffective. I mean, what good did, good did they do with Ukraine? I mean, they just practically leveled thousands dead. I, I don't see where it's helped Ukraine. 
at all. I mean, we've hurt Russia, but how does it help Ukraine? There's a comment more than anything. Do you have any comment on the relationship of the Russian Orthodox Church and Putin's regime? I've read things, heard things about a, a tightness there and almost a complicity. Well, yes, this is a tradition in Russia that the Orthodox Church is much more closely tied to the state than would be churches in the West uh, to, to the state. I mean, of course, this wasn't true during the communist era, which was, of course, an atheist regime. But during the czarist era, the, 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 the church was very closely tied to the state, and the czar was, was you know, by official church uh, doctrine, the God's representative on earth. Um, and, uh, and so in the, in the, in the post-Soviet era, at least in the Putin era, yeah, the, the Russian Orthodox Church is very closely associated with the state and very supportive of, of the state. And they've been very vocally supportive of the war. Um, that's, that's for sure. Um, but the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church doesn't have as much kind of influence on public opinion as do churches in the United States. I mean, um, uh, church attendance is very, very low. Many, pe many Russians report... <clears throat> Well, first of all, levels of religiosity in Russia are much lower than in the United States, but then levels of church attendance are, are, are much lower still. Um, in, in Orthodox Christianity, uh, church attendance just doesn't have the same meaning. You know, there's not like sermons in the same way there are in Protestant religions. Um, so, so Orthodox priests don't really have the same opportunity to influence public opinion. They can't on Sunday give some political sermon. It's all in these, you know, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Is this material going to be on the test? No, no, no. Absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Oh, one more. <laughs> Does your work have any predictive value? Well, I don't know. I guess we'll see, right? <laughs> well, no, the reason I ask, uh, a lot of studies in psychology say that the masses are always wrong at critical turning points. We can use our stock market as an example of that. And when everybody goes right, it's probably better off to go left. And, and that's why, is any of this used for predictive purposes? I mean, it seems to be very interesting, but the figures aren't showing any type of uh, correlation to change, I can say that. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, well, <clears throat> I guess my point is we'll see, right? I mean, so that the... Uh, Have you noticed this in all the years you've been doing it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, like, that's what I was saying earlier. Like, you can, you can definitely see evidence that the regime responds to changes in public opinion. They do things in response to to changes in public opinion. So, yeah. Is that it then for everybody? No? It's okay. We have a few more minutes. If you say the, re the regime will respond to public opinion, everything that I've read about the current situation is very, very volatile. And since the conscription announcement, over 700,000 men have tried to flee and get out of the country. That has to have some public repercussions. Um, and, and, the, and the whole issue about the threat of nuclear war and the kind of deranged speech that Putin just gave. Uh, but the sense, at least as I read Western media, is that it's very, very volatile. And do you think that the Russian people understand that kind of volatil volatility? Or what do you think the response eventually will be? Uh, so, so do they? Well, I think. Um, oh, you let, okay. Let me put it this way. So polls indicate the Russians are very concerned and anxious, more so than Americans are. They're very worried about nuclear war. They're very worried about you know, being nuked by the West. They think most Russians, not most, but the same numbers of Russians that I put up here that support the war, most of them also think they really do think that the West is trying to destroy Russia, and that the West is, you know, intent 
on wiping Russia off the face of the earth. So they're very anxious about this. They're very concerned about this <coughs> happening. Um, so, yeah, if that answers your question about like, their concern, if that's what you meant by volatility. 